Okay, so I wanted to put together a short video that describes some of the concepts behind the respiratory physiology lab. We'll be performing with our biopack equipment next week. Essentially what we're going to do is we're going to run two tests. One's called the pulmonary function test one in biopack. What we're going to do is look at lung volumes. We're also going to run pulmonary function test two in biopack. We're going to do the first one, which is FEV1. And we're going to look at the ratio of FEV1 over FVC. So those are the two tests we're going to run. We may not have covered this in lecture yet, so I also want to just give some background on what we're talking about. The first thing I want to point out, just looking at this model, is obviously we need air down into our lungs. But it's not a simple process. It seems real simple, but there's two things going on. We need the flow of air to go down into the lungs. But that's going to be dependent on the ability to change pressure and the resistance. So anytime you're looking at the flow of something, whether it's water, electrons and electricity, or air, the law that applies is called Ohm's law. And real simply, Ohm's law states that the flow of something is determined by how motivated that flow is. How much does that flow want to occur? And that's divided by what is trying to resist that flow. In electricity, the equation equals current equals voltage over resistance. In water, it's the flow of water is equal to the pressure over the resistance. And in air, much like water, the flow of air is determined by the ability to change pressure divided by the resistance to the flow of air. So if we look at the lung, the size of the alveolus must change in volume first for the pressure to change. That's something called Boyle's Law. What it comes down to is if you have a certain number of molecules in a confined space, then the pressure of that confined space is caused by the molecules in that space hitting the wall. So if you make the walls closer, then those molecules are going to hit more often. So what that means is if you decrease volume, you're going to increase pressure. If you make those walls further apart, that means you're increasing the volume and you're decreasing pressure. So essentially, Boyle's Law just tells us that pressure and volume head in opposite directions. And why this matters for us is the way the lung basically works is you change the volume of the alveolus, and that changes the pressure. If you make the alveolus bigger, it decreases pressure, so then air flows into the lungs. If you decrease the volume of the alveolus, then pressure is going to go up, and that's going to push air out of the lungs. So breathing is a matter of changing volume, and that changes pressure. And that plays into airflow because the ability to change pressure is a major determinant of airflow. However, once you change that pressure, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a change in flow because we also have to consider this resistance factor. In the case of the lung, the resistance essentially comes from the diameter of the airways. So looking at this diagram, you can see that there's essentially two places where things can go wrong. You have a problem changing volume, which means you can't change pressure, and you can also have resistance. And that's essentially what it comes down to when you're looking at lung disorders. There's basically what are called restrictive disorders, where you can't change the pressure. And there are obstructive disorders, where something is in the way, and that's affecting the resistance. Now, you have to be a little bit careful, because restrictive disorders, it sounds like resistance. But restrictive disorders, where the term comes from, there's some sort of restriction restricting the ability of the alveolus to change its volume and thus change its pressure. And that's different than resistance, which causes an obstruction. So be careful in noting those two terms. Okay, so now that we've defined the main two different types of disorders that affect the lungs, let's come over here and look at restrictive disorders a little bit more closely. First of all, the problem is generally that you can't change the volume of the alveolus, which means you can't change the pressure. Now, technically, it may be that you can't make the volume larger because there's something causing the alveolus to be sticky. It could be fluid or mucus, or perhaps there's scarring of the tissue. So the tissue doesn't want to expand because scar tissue generally isn't as flexible. So you can't increase the volume of the alveolus, decrease the pressure, and breathe in. You're going to see this by decreased inspiratory volume. We'll get to that in a second. There can also be conditions where it's hard to breathe out. In this case, emphysema is a good example because what happens in emphysema is smoking or other pollutants basically damage the ability of the lungs to regulate something called trypsin. Trypsin normally will digest protein, bacteria, and things like that, just like it digests protein in your digestion digestive system. But if it's unregulated because the enzyme that regulates it is damaged by smoking, that's alpha-1 antitrypsin, then essentially the trypsin will start to digest the elastic fibers that surround the alveoli. Those elastic fibers make those alveoli recoil. If they can't recoil, then you essentially cannot decrease the volume of the alveolus, cannot increase the pressure, and can't breathe out. So that's going to decrease expiratory volumes. Again, we're going to look at this by looking at pulmonary function test one, where essentially we're going to get lung volumes. Down here is a diagram of different lung volumes, and it looks fairly complex, but it's pretty easy to break it down if you realize there's four main lung volumes that you care about. There's all in when you ask somebody to breathe in all the air. How much air can they get in? There's all out. How much air can you get out? There's normal in. What's the normal volume of air when you breathe in? What's the normal volume of air when you breathe out? 
and all of these lung volumes down here, then basically are simple arithmetic combinations of those four values. For example, inspiratory capacity is the difference between all in and a normal out. And that would be affected in somebody who had a restrictive disorder that affected the ability of the alveolus to increase, like fluid, mucus, or scarring. Our expiratory volumes are down here. The main one is expiratory reserve volume, and that's the difference between normal out and all outs. And again, that's one that's going to be affected in emphysema. Another key one is vital capacity. Vital capacity is the difference between all in and all out. And one remaining one that's pretty key is something called total lung capacity. The main difference between vital capacity and total lung capacity is something down here called residual volume. That's the amount of air left in the lungs after you try to breathe all the way out. It can be actually calculated by having somebody breathe in a helium concentration and watch the dilution of that helium, or generally it's just estimated to be around one liter. One of the things you can also note, I mentioned that inspiratory capacity and expiratory reserve are going to be affected in different restrictive disorders. I've kind of drawn some lines on here. The blue line represents an obstructive disorder, and the green line represents a restrictive disorder. Once you have these values, then what you want to do is essentially look at what the estimated value is. So you want to compare your total lung capacity to expectation. Normal males will have a TLC of 6 liters. Normal females will have a TLC of 4.2 liters. So if you take your total lung capacity and divide it by expected, you'll get some percentage of normal. If you're over 80% of normal, then you do not have a restrictive disorder. If you're between 70 and 79% of normal, you have a mild restrictive disorder. If you're under 50% of what is expected, so if your TLC is 3 liters, then you have a fairly severe restrictive disorder. All these values are pulled from the Merck, and that's the website right there if you want more details on that. Let's move over then and look at obstructive disorders. And again, these are disorders of resistance, so you may be able to change the pressure just fine, but there's something resisting the flow there's a decrease in the diameter of the airwaves. And that can happen in something like asthma, or you can have additional fluid lining the airwaves, as in bronchitis. We're going to look at this by looking at pulmonary function 2 in the Biopack software. And essentially, we're going to do the first one, which is FEV. We also need to do forced vital capacity. We talked about vital capacity over here. Vital capacity is the difference between all in and all out. In our case, we're going to do that under maximum effort, and so it's called a forced vital capacity. And that's going to be a key thing when you do your experiment. You're going to get abnormally low values if you're not trying really, really hard to force out the air as fast as you can. When you look at the diagram that is output by the biopack, it's going to look something like this. What the software is actually going to do is take this portion of the curve, the expiration, which is kind of over here. It's going to take that portion of the curve and kind of flip it on its side. It doesn't look exactly the same, but that's essentially what we're doing. And so the difference between the baseline here and up here is that forced vital capacity. So that's what FVC is. FEV1 is also a critical value, and what that is, what that stands for, is forced expiratory volume at one second. And that's a measure of how much volume of air you've gotten out in the first second of expiration. It's going to show up over here on your graph. So after one second, what's the volume of air that was expired? And the reason this is an important value is because someone with asthma, they might be able to breathe in just as much air as a normal person, but it's going to take them a lot longer to get that air out because they're trying to breathe that air through a narrower tube. Technically, someone with asthma can move as much air or even more than a normal person. They just can't do it as fast. And so the way we would see this on this curve is it would take much longer to get that air out. So someone with asthma, if you listen to them expire, it takes them much longer to get that air out. So I talked about two values there. There's the FEV1. The FEV1 can be measured as a percent predicted. And so there's a calculation based on your height and your sex, whether you're male or female, what FEV1 should be. And so what you'll do is you'll take your FEV1 and divide by the predicted value, and you'll get that predicted value by using this equation. There's also an online calculator if you want to try and find that as well. One of the reasons I like sending people to the actual online one is you'll realize there's several different ways to calculate this. There's not a real consensus on exactly how to calculate FEV1 predicted. So again, you'll divide your FEV1 by predicted, and you'll get a measure that'll tell you whether you're normal or whether you have an obstructive disorder and how severe that obstructive disorder is, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. Probably more accurate measure is to take that FEV1 and divide it by FVC, and that will give you a number that hopefully is above 70, that that number is just above 70. If it's less than 70, it generally indicates there's some sort of obstructive disorder. Okay, so that's a basic introduction to the lab. We're going to do pulmonary function test 1 and pulmonary function test 2. We're going to try and diagnose either restrictive disorders or obstructive disorders. Thank you.